place since she was a teenager. And uh, she did her undergraduate work in US history with the, the idea that it, uh, she'd probably have a career as a high school history teacher. But then uh, she and her army husband uh, started moving around the country. Uh, John was an army chaplain and uh, she developed a, a love for early childhood. And so she went back to school, got her master's degree in early childhood education. And she made her career as an army civilian working in the child and youth programs. Corey, her husband and their youngest son moved to Tucson in November of 2020. Uh, and that at that time they joined us on the Civil War Roundtable. Her love of quilting is, is also fairly recent. Um, she has loved working with fabrics uh, since she was young, however. Uh, she heard a presentation by a quilt historian who specialized in Civil War history. And so she found she could combine her love of fabrics along with her love of history. And uh, she enjoys seeing how quilting uh, can be an expression of the women's voice uh, during the Civil War. Uh, John and Corey are both native Southern Californians, but they've lived and worked uh, uh, many places in the U United States and abroad. Uh, after retirement, she established her company, Corey Sue's Creations, in March of 2019. And she's won a plethora of awards for her jewelry and pine needle baskets and has participated in a number of craft shows literally all over the country. And so uh, she's been to a lot of the Civil War sites, wants to go to more. And she and John also really enjoy visiting national parks as we all do. So without further ado, uh, Corey Babcock, thank you for being here. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you some of the things that I've been learning over the last year. And it literally is something that I've just developed over the last year. Um, I'm going to check my view here and make sure that I'm not. You're doing All right. fine. All you need to do is start your um, share. Okay. Yeah, it's hard for me to tell exactly how, how it's working. Um, I thought before I shared the slides, I should at least mention about what quilting is. I think it's a very common term. Most people are very familiar with quilting, but I thought sometimes the show and tell is helpful. So I'm holding up, um, probably can't see it really well, but this is um, one of the quilting sample things that I started. And the quilt has three parts to it. The top part, which you can see with the green, the light and dark green. And then on the edges, you can see white, which is the batting. The batting is the part that makes it so it stays warm. And then on the back, you can use any kind of material. So there's three fabrics that go into quilting. And what, what makes it a quilt is the fact that you have all three of those layers sewn together um, through all three layers. And that quilt process in the Civil War was very different than it is today. The products that we use are different. And in the Civil War, they had to sew those stitches very close together because the batting, which was either cotton or wool, was not as stable as we have today. And so if it got wet, that cotton would wad up if they didn't have their stitches close together to keep the three um, fabrics together. So I just thought that would be helpful to, to know what I'm talking about when I say quilting. So let me go ahead and share my screen and get started. So is, the, is it on the, the actual slide for everybody? The beginning slide? Yes, you're good. Okay, and are you able to see where my cursor is when I move it? It's right on the word through yes. right now. Yes, we okay, can. Great. It's small, but we can see it. Right. Okay. There's a couple of them that I'll I'll need to have that. So this quilt that you're seeing in front of you is 
a sample of what a quilt would have been like in the Civil War. The colors that you're seeing, the patterns that you're seeing are very similar in reproduction material um, of the Civil War. And usually in the Civil War, there were fairly traditional patterns that were used. And you can see if you can tell where my cursor is with the triangles, the blue and the um, tan with the gray stripes here in the above the word through, um, that is called a quilt square. And next to it is actual a lot of squares put together into a quilt square. And so this is a very typical type of quilt that would have been done during the Civil War using just all sorts of scrap fabrics. In some cases, as the Civil War raged on, they were cutting up dresses and things in order to um, have a more useful material to make for the quilts. What I'll be covering today is talking about quilting in relation to historical events that occurred during that time. I thought I, it would be helpful to see that even though the women didn't have a, the vote, they weren't necessarily vocal in the political arena, sometimes they used the quilts to show their feelings and their thoughts. And so we'll talk about women's voice through the quilts and talk about some individual stories of some of the women. And I tried to pick women from both the South and the North so you could see the representation from both sides. And then we'll just quickly end with um, how Civil War quilts are being used today and reproduction quilts, um, the material that's being used to reproduce what would have been part of the quilting times during the Civil War. So just in, sort of a, an invention that happened just prior to the Civil War in 1842 that really made a difference in quilting. And that was the invention of the sewing machine. And I, Elias Howe, the picture you can see on your far left, um, oops, my cursor is very sensitive, sorry. Um, Elias Howe patented the first US sewing machine in 1842. And soon after that, in the 1850s, Isaac Singer, in the middle picture, actually built the first sewing machine and mass produced it. And this, of course, was the part of the Industrial Revolution that was going on at the time. The machines were sold for $125, so it wasn't cheap in, the, in that time. But he had the idea that, oh, we can do it on installment plans. And so he made it so they could pay $5 a month and able to buy their sewing machines. And the difference this made, not just in quilting, but in sewing in general, was that what took them hours and hours to do was now done in minutes on a sewing machine. So that was really an important advancement in sewing and especially in quilting. And they not only sewed the quilt squares together, but they did the actual quilting on this machine. And sort of, I guess, sort of a trivial thing, but safety pins were inv invented soon after that. And when you're doing the quilting, and, and a lot of times the hand quilting was done on a big frame where all three layers of cloth were stretched and they could sew the quilting stitches, the safety pins were so much different than just a straight pin to hold everything together. And it made it so much easier for them to do that. Also, the fabric that was very commonly used in the quilt would be cotton. And as everyone I'm sure is aware, the cotton was grown in the South. The picture on the left shows the slaves in Louisiana in the 1860s picking cotton. And in the North, they had the textile mills. So I, even though the product itself was grown in the South, they pretty much exported most, most of it to the North or to England. And during the Civil War, the cost of cotton went from eight cents a yard to a dollar. Now, I'd love to pay a dollar a yard now, but at that time, that was quite an increase for them to buy cotton. And in the South, as we'll talk about in a little bit, it was very difficult to get the manufactured um, cotton because, like I said, they don't, didn't have the textile mills there in the South. And so the textile mill that's shown in the left-hand picture or the right-hand picture is a textile mill in Massachusetts in the 1860s. And some of the one of the stories I'll tell is about um, 
how some of the women were revolting against the conditions in those textile mills at the time. The other thing that sounds like a sort of trivial thing, but it did make a difference in, in the quilting in the Civil War was the invention of the indelible ink pen. And prior to this, the, the ink pens were unreliable. They could bleed across the material. They just couldn't write messages very clearly. But with the invention in 1834 by Dr. Henry Stevens of the indelible ink pen, they were able to write messages. They were able to sign their names, maybe put the date of the quilt. Now, I will say that there were not very many quilts that survived from the Civil War into current day. Um, in fact, the pictures that I'll be showing and the stories that I'll be telling, I tried to pick ones where it was the actual quilt that survived so that you could see um, some of the, the original material. And in a lot of those during this time, because they could write these messages, they were using this ink pen. So it was very common to have quilts with messages on them. And then just a picture of some of the colors and the designs that you would have seen in the material during the Civil War. Um, and here on the far left, you have your darker colors, your browns and your blacks, and getting into the blue colors. Indigo was a very popular blue color. They, many of the women dyed their own fabric. And so they were using different plants. It was pretty much a plant-based dye. And the orange that you see here in the top middle, they didn't always know some of the ingredients of those dyes and how it would affect um, them. And, and today we would have known not to use lead in the dyes, but the dye for the orange at the time had lead in it. And they didn't realize that that would not be a good thing to do. And the reds that you see in the pinks, um, the reds were more of a burgundy than a really true bright red that we might see today. So you don't see maybe the bright, vibrant colors that you might have in the fabric today. But with the invention of the, um, in the machines that they're using in the textile mills, they were able to do the designs with three or four different colors sometimes, which was much easier in the inventions that they had to use. And so you still had solid colors. You had some fabric with floral, some with geometric. And Paisley, for those of us who remember Paisley in the 70s, that was used in the Civil War as well, and stripes. And so those were the common patterns that you would see. And the quilt historians are very conscious of what fabrics were used, what colors were used, and what designs were used. And so when they're dating a quilt to see if it really was from the Civil War, if the design or that color was not in use during the Civil War, they know it was made after that. And so many times they're not able to tell who made it or when, but they can tell that it probably was made during the Civil War. The way that they used the quilts during the Civil War, the Sanitary Commission, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with in the North, was formed to um, help the Northern soldiers and the Northern cause, especially um, making and giving supplies to the soldiers and to the hospitals. And they put out a call for quilts and comforters to be made and sent to the soldiers. And they are very specific about the quilt size that was needed. It needed to fit a cot four foot by eight feet because that was the size of the cots that they had when they were out in the field. And it had to be eas easily rolled up so they could carry it with them. So they didn't want anything really bulky and they wanted to have this very specific size of, cot, of um, quilt. And so the batting that they were using was a very thin batting and like I said, in cotton and wool were the most common. Wool was used probably more in the north um, as, as cotton maybe became a little more scarce. But I thought it was interesting. The Sanitary Commission kept very good records. And they, in their records, they show that over 250,000 quilts were made and sent to the soldiers, which I thought was pretty staggering to have the northern women gather together, many of them gather together in quilting bees, 
And most people today know the quilting bees when the women would get together and they would bring various squares from what they'd made or they made them there together and they would put them together um, and make them for the sanitary commission. The quilts were also used in the sanitary commission fairs. And in the fairs, they would raffle and sell the quilts in order to raise money for the war effort. And there were many quilts that were sold at sanitary commission fairs for this purpose. So not only were they donating the quilts that they'd made, but they were also using them to raise money. In the South, it didn't seem like, from what the historians can tell, that they were quite as organized as in the North. Many times on a plantation, they might be organized to make quilts for their soldiers going to war. Um, and as the war went on, and they didn't necessarily have the fabric and the things that they needed, some of the documentation talks about them pulling apart mattresses and using the fabric on the mattress for the top or the bottom of the quilt and the inside of the mattress to use for the, the batting in the center. They also didn't have quite as good of a record as the Sanitary Commission did, but there is documentation that they made gunboat quilts. And those were made and auctioned off to raise money to build gunboats. And one documentation showed that they raised enough money to purchase three of these gunboats, which were quite expensive. And so quilts were definitely not maybe the most important thing going on in the war, but it certainly did play a part not only in what the soldier needed in the field, but also to raise money for the war effort. The Northern embargo certainly made a big difference in the South being able to get supplies. And one of those supplies was the fabric. And so what you found prior to the Civil War was the Southern ladies would be wearing dresses of silk and very nice, fine material. And as the war went on, when they had no access to that, they were using um, homespun and that was made and they could make it themselves. And it was a very rough type cotton fabric. In, in the prior to the Civil War, the slaves were the only ones that wore homespun, anything made with homespun. But after the war went on, um, the Southern ladies needed to also wear the homespun. And what I thought was also interesting in some of the documentations, it talks about when the soldiers, the Northern soldiers would go into the Southern homes, they would break the needles, not just if they had sewing machines, but also just plain needles so that it didn't allow them to make any more supply things that were needed, either clothing or these quilts. And so I didn't realize that that was one of the things that was happening. Many of the quilts that we see are probably more from the North than from the South. And one of the reasons is, is the many of the people in the South buried their fine things so that they wouldn't be found by the Northern soldiers. And often the quilt was used to um, hold all of those things that they buried. Um, both sides would often bury their dead in the quilts. And so, again, just another reason we don't see a lot of Civil War quilts today. One story that I found in several different books that I thought was very interesting, but unfortunately the historians for quilting are not able to verify the truth of the story. It's an oral history that was passed down in Black families talking about the use of quilts and the symbols on the quilt being used in order to help the slaves as they use the Underground Railroad. And so the quilt that I'm showing here, um, the second row down the, the square to the far right, this is called a log cabin square. And in the center of that, you can see a black, um, a black square. Normally in a log cabin square, that center square is red, but the oral history indicates that if that was hanging out um, to draw to air out, which was very common for quilts to be hanging outside, if that was hanging outside of a home, it meant to the slave that this was a safe home. And if that black 
the square was there in the center of that log cabin, that meant it really was a safe home. It wasn't just a, a log cabin square made by someone. Um, because like I said, the common thing is to have red in the center, but if it had black, that would indicate that it was a safe home. And so many of the symbols of these quilts um, were supposed to indicate some of the routes to travel or some of the things to be aware of in their travels. And so if you look at the bottom square here on the, the left, it showed that there was a zigzag course that they needed to take in order to avoid um, those that might be trying to capture them. Um, the one that with the star was to indicate follow the North Star. And so the slaves weren't very, they weren't literate. And so they felt, felt that by using these symbols, they were able to help the slaves to know what to do in using the Underground Railroad. But as you, as I mentioned, because it's only oral history that was passed down, there was nothing else to verify it. And sometimes as they looked at the squares that were used, they, the historians felt that those weren't really in common use during the Civil War. So it was very difficult to verify for them that this oral history was true. But the families that passed that oral history down and, and had some of those quilts do feel very strongly that that was part of what they used quilts for during the Civil War. So let's get into some of the quilts. And I apologize, some of the pictures are not very clear. Um, this particular one is a friendship quilt. And in during this time, also what was going on was people traveling westward, the westward movement. And because, as I mentioned, they had these indelible ink pens, they would often get together as someone was going west and each friend would make a square and they would put their name or their date or a message on it. And they would use the very light colored fabric. And again, it's just not a very clear picture, but I I'm, was one of the few that I could find of a actual Civil War quilt at the time, but they would have been writing the messages on these very light colored strips. And they often would would put these together and some of the seamstresses were very fine seamstresses, very precise and others weren't, but it didn't matter when they put the quilt together. As you can tell by this one, it isn't exactly lined up. Um, if someone is very picky about it, they would say, mm, no, that's not gonna work, but it did work for those that were making this for their friends. And during the industrial revolution, one of the stories about these friendship quilts were also had to do with the, the women who worked in the factories. And they participated in advocating for the workers in better conditions. And many of the mill workers um, signed an anti-slavery petition that was presented to Congress in April of 1838. And it was to ban abolition and also um, give their views on the conditions that were in some of these textile mills. And altogether, the people that sent this petition, um, they this documented that it filled a room 20 by 30 by 14 feet with it closely packed all the way to the ceiling. Um, nothing happened with those petitions, but I just thought it was interesting. The, the quilt that you're seeing here was made a little bit before the Civil War in 1845. It's called the Lowell Offering. And um, it was published in an article um, at that time and talked about the use of this quilt um, representing women showing their voice. The next quilt that is called the Deborah Coates quilt. And it was made between 1840 and 1850. And you can't see in the large quilt on the left what was happening or what the Deborah Coates put into the quilt, but the picture in the middle you can see as a slave and the words underneath that are deliver me from the oppression of man. And unfortunately, as this quilt was passed to generations after it was made, the granddaughters of the person who made this, Deborah Coates, 
they each wanted the quilt. And so their solution was to cut the quilt in half. And so you can see this line right down the middle. And unfortunately, the picture of the slave made with this indel oops, sorry, made with the indelible ink was right in the center of the quilt. And so you can't see it um, when they cut the quilt in half, it was totally lost. You might see the foot of the slave down here, maybe the tiny bit of the foot or maybe a little bit of the hand because they didn't want a raw edge on the quilt as they um, cut it in half. But the oral history was passed down that she was expressing her views about slavery in the quilt and in the center was this picture of the slave. And so eventually it was passed down to one person who got both halves of the quilt. And she very carefully took it apart and was able to find this picture and to put it back so that it was more easily seen. Um, that it was also interesting. They were from in Pennsylvania. That's where the Coates family was. And it was discovered, too, that their home was station number five in the Underground Railroad. So they definitely were involved in helping the slaves to get to freedom. The next quilt is not maybe too dramatic in itself. It's called the basket. I think that's can easily tell why the name of the quilt is the basket. It was made between 1863 and 1864. And it was made by a woman, Mary High. Um, at the time she was not married, but she got married soon after that to Benjamin Prince. So it's Mary High Prince and her friends that made this. And it's one of several quilts made by Southern women in um, Bedford County in Tennessee. And this particular quilt did survive. Um, and it's not, like I said, on its own, it's not really all that exciting. But what I, I thought was interesting was that the feeling certainly ran high on both sides for feeling very strongly about their cause. And Mary High Prince, 70, when she was 70, she made this pillow that you can see down in the corner. And this was many, many years in 1910 after the Civil War, but she still was showing her very strong feelings about the Civil War. And I typed up in the slide what it said. It's a little hard to read in the pillow, but she writes, hurrah for the homespun dresses. These are the ones I, I mentioned before. We Southern ladies worn in time of war every piece here, and I didn't misspell anything. It was actually written that way in, the, in her embroidery. Sad memories it brings back to me, for our hearts was weary and restless, and our life was full of care. The burden laid upon us seemed greater than we could bear. And so, again, I just thought it was interesting that she still, even at 70, would think back on that time and had very strong feelings about it. And in the in the pillow of, of the border, these are homespun dresses that she had saved from the time of the Civil War. And she used those in this pillow in the border of the, of the pillow. Another quilt um, from the Southern um, family, Charles Colcott Jones family, was made in 1861, a little bit before the Civil War. And I'm showing this one because that was prior to the, to the war. And so they had access to much finer material. And this particular one used really expensive type material. Um, the family were slave owners in Georgia. Their Montevideo plantation um, was where the mother Mary lived and she wrote in a note to her grand to her daughter tell my dear little granddaughter um she's wanting the daughter to tell the the little granddaughter that um grandma is sending a little quilt for her bed perhaps you could make lucy quilt it well lucy was a slave and so even though this was being touted as the grandmother sending it to the um, daughter for her granddaughter. 
um, much of the work that was done on it was done by slaves. And this was very typical from the documentation that they can find. It wasn't that Southern ladies didn't sew and that they didn't perhaps make a quilt, but it was often documented that the slaves were the ones that actually did much of the fine work on it. And so one of the stories that I read was about Fanny Moore, who was a slave, and she told, and this is in quotes, in a, a let um, in documentation, she worked in the field all day and pieced and quilted all night. I had to hold the light for her to see by. Um, so again, it's difficult to see um, exactly who did the quilting on some of the quilts from the South, but from some of the documentation that's come through, it looks like many of the slaves were the ones that, that did a lot of the quilting. And this one is sort of a follow on to that. This quilt on the far left is made from scraps or not scraps. It's made from gowns from Mary Todd Lincoln. It's called the Mary Todd Lincoln gown quilt. And Elizabeth Keckley made the quilt from the, the gowns that had been worn by Mary Todd Lincoln. And Elizabeth Keckley was a former slave and she, when she got her freedom, became Mrs. Lincoln's seamstress and confidant. And I thought I, I couldn't find in my research exactly how she was able to sell the sewing that she was doing to make enough money, but she apparently was able to do that somehow. And she was able to buy her own freedom. And she ended up in Washington, D.C. And I would mentioned earlier about the Sanitary Commission and the fact that they were selling quilts in order to raise money. Well, Elizabeth saw that the, the Black people were really suffering. And as she was walking down the streets of Washington, D.C., she passed one of these sanitary commission fairs and saw that they were selling quilts. And she's a seamstress. So she thought, well, I can help start an organization that can do the same type thing to help Blacks. And so she helped to start the Contraband Relief Association. And there was an autobiography of her life called Behind the Scenes, 30 Years a Slave and Four Years in the White House. I haven't read that book. I, I would be very interested to, to do that after doing some of this research. But the pictures that you see, the picture in the middle, was not necessarily one of the gowns that was cut up to make this quilt, but it certainly was an era. Um, it, it was one of the gowns that Mary Todd Lincoln wore. And you can see in the far right, Sally Fields plays Mary Todd Lincoln in a gown that was typical of the time and probably a reproduction of one of her gowns that Mrs. Lincoln wore. And she played, um, Sally Fields played Mrs. Lincoln in a movie. So now let's talk about some of the actual women during the Civil War. Hannah Ropes was a became a nurse during the Civil War, and she was among several women that um, volunteered to become a nurse. And it was very typical um, when they were working in the hospitals that they might be sitting by a soldier. Um, and one of the stories about Hannah Ropes was that she would often be stay the night in the hospital and so by candlelight and make quilts and so the quilt that you see here is called an album quilt and it's a little easier perhaps in the center where the white squares are to see that something is written in there and so that's where messages were written to the soldiers um, maybe their names and so this is where again they use that ink in order to um, make a special quilt for that soldier. She worked in the Union Hotel Hospital in Georgetown in D.C. And again, it's not necessarily that she made this quilt. It did survive and it could have been made by her, um, but it's very typical of what was made at the time. She was married. Um, she was born in 1809. She was married when she was 24 and she became involved in the anti-slavery activities. And interestingly enough, her husband left her when she was 40 with four children, leaving her as a single mom. Um, and so she, it, I couldn't find out why or anything about him, 
but she did her eldest son was old enough he's a um, young adult at the time and he went to kansas and of course at the time in 1850s um, kansas was one of those states that they were encouraging people from the north to go in order to make sure it wasn't a slave state and those in the south were wanting people to go there to make sure it was a slave state and so the the kansas troubles was certainly something that was going on at the time. And she did follow her eldest son to Kansas um, in order to have it, he could vote to have it a free state. Their home, she had an interest in, in helping people even then. Their home became a makeshift hospital in Lawrence, Kansas. And a lot of times she cared for typhoid and malaria victims. She herself unfortunately contracted malaria, did recover, but decided that she would return to Massachusetts with her daughter. And she wrote a book um, called Six Months in Kansas by a Lady. And after Fort Sumter's battle, there was a call for women to volunteer to work with the wounded and ill. And that's the beginnings of the Nurses Corps. And I thought it was really interesting that one of the qualifications for the nurses was that they be required to be plain looking women. They didn't want anybody to, that was good looking to be a nurse. Um, there were a lot of stories apparently going around that nurses were loose women. And so they were trying to weed out any of those possibilities. Um, and Mary or Hannah Ropes didn't have trouble with that particular requirement, but one of the requirements was to execute the directions of the surgeons. And believe it or not, the surgeons and the nurses weren't always in accord of what needed to happen or what the role of the nurse was. And so she didn't always have an easy time following the directions of the surgeon. She really felt strongly that her role was to be a comforter and to to hold their hands and to help them through the illnesses or the um, injuries that they had suffered during the Civil War. And unfortunately, she contracted typhoid fever during that time. She was at that Union Hotel Hospital in Georgetown and she um, passed on, but she did leave a diary and her children published it as a book, Civil War Nurse. And so it talks about her, um, the lack of respect for the nurses at the time and some of the problems being faced by nurses in the Civil War. The next one is um, a story of, that I read about Beersheba Fristone Younger. And her husband was definitely a Southern sympathizer. He moved from Tennessee to Missouri and there were raids of Kansas homes by um, of, of the Southern sympathizers and her sons, her eldest sons participated in some of those raids of the Northern homes in the Kansas territory. And even though it wasn't documented that her husband was part of that raid soon after th those raids, the sons were involved in, her husband was murdered. And just as sort of a side note, you probably recognize the younger gang. Um, they were part of the James gang after the war. Um, and so even though there's not documentation that she or the younger children were necessarily Southern sympathizers, she was banished from her home and they made her watch her home burn down. And so the quilt that you see on the right is called the crown of thorns. And that was representative of her feeling that she was persecuted and um, she became a refugee. And I just thought it was interesting that again, you wouldn't think perhaps that that would be a, a strong thing to talk about with quilting. And yet the quilts often did represent people's feelings. And so feeling that she was persecuted was definitely the way the, the quilt was used. The next one um, is a quilt called Patriotic. You can tell why with the flag very prominent in it. And this was by a Northern um, woman and it was made in 1866 by Mrs. Alfred Van Fleet. And 
many times they would use patriotic themes. And this was one of those that she might have used a pattern, although she certainly could have um, used her own thought on how to make a flag and what to do. But what was very interesting about this particular quilt, which did survive, is, is that when you look at the third stripe, the white stripe here, right um, across from the bottom of the star, it looks like something is in there, written in there. And she put her husband's name, um, his rank, he was a sergeant um, for the North, and she arranged the battles that he fought in, in Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. There were over 47 battles and she embroidered them, or excuse me, she wrote them with this indelible ink in that particular um, stripe that you see in the quilt. It's unclear why she ended with the battles in um, 1863, he was, in the Gettysburg battle, Sergeant Van Fleet was shot off his horse at Gettysburg, but he did recover and return to battle, but she didn't document any of those. Um, again, it's unclear why, but she certainly did document the things, the battles that he was in prior to that. And this is just one of many patriotic quilts that were done during the Civil War, not just by the, the North, but also by the South. There's a quilt called the Seven Sisters that was made in the South, to represent the first step, seven states that seceded from the Union. And so the quilts that were made, the patriotic quilts, were done on both sides. The, the next one is about um, how sometimes quilts might have been started in one time, and this one was started just around the time of the end of the Civil War. Um, and then maybe finish later on for a cause that was an ongoing cause like women's suffrage. And this is a, a quilt made by Abigail Scott Dunaway. And she was a pioneer. She went with her family, her husband and children to Oregon. And she became quite an advocate for women's suffrage. Um, and so her husband became an invalid. And in order to support the family, she became a milliner um, to support the husband and the six children. Interestingly enough, the stories are that she really despised sewing, but it was a legitimate profession for her to make money in order to support the family. And so she did make it her business and was successful. And while she was in her shop, many of the women that came in um, had, had horrible stories of what was happening to them. And they didn't have the vote. They weren't able to make any changes. And so she became quite an advocate for the women's suffrage. She had a little bit of background with that. Her parents were Southern abolitionists before they moved North. And so she had some of that background of, of working for a cause. And in the quilt, you can maybe see this little red panel down here. In that she wrote, this quilt was pieced in November, 1869. Um, by Abigail Scott Dunaway and was finished and quilted by her in November of 1900. So again, quite a, a gap there. It was started near the end of the Civil War, used the fabrics that you would have seen during the Civil War, but actually wasn't completed until November of 1900. And she was donating it to the first National Women's Suffrage Bazaar. And she did it in honor of Theodore Roosevelt because she felt he was the first champion of the equal suffrage movement ever elected to a national office by popular vote. And so I, I realized this quilt really wasn't a Civil War quilt. It was started um, and the materials were purchased during the end of the Civil War. But I just thought it was an interesting story that, and that's even typical today, sometimes people will put aside something and later on, um, bring it back and many years later, or maybe that quilt was started by a grandmother and someone inherits it and, and, and finishes it. And then the last quilt I wanted to talk about is Lucinda Ward Honstein's Reconciliation Quilt. And this was done right after the Civil War in 1867. And this definitely was pretty much her own patterns or she adapted patterns. And it was much more um, 
it, it wasn't the traditional blocks that you would normally see. Lucinda was born in Brooklyn in New York in 1820, and she was married in 1842 to her husband, John, who served in the Union Army. And interestingly enough, she was divorced in 18, he divorced her in Ohio in 1866. Um, and then she died in 1904. But this quilt made right after the Civil War was completed, she herself called the reconciliation quilt. And I'll talk about a couple of the squares in it where she was trying maybe to, to show both sides and to, to say we can be one country again. The block that you see right here in the middle, it's almost three blocks. It's just one complete one. Um, that's her home in New York. And so she quilted her home. Her family um, was a family that had, um, oops, sorry. Her family had a dry goods business. And so the square on the second row from the bottom, the fourth square in, you can't maybe see it as well, but this is a horse um, drawn buggy. And there's a man sitting on it, they believed was her brother taking the dry goods to market. And what I thought was really interesting is the third row down, the second square in, is a black man um, talking to a white man. And notice that the size of the black man is much larger than the white. And the words inscribed in it are, Master, I am free. And that's written just between the two men um, here. And again, sort of showing maybe the reconciliation was the square in the second row, third block in, the man and the woman. And the man was representative or was supposed to represent um, Jefferson Davis. And the woman was supposed to represent his daughter. And it was believed that she was trying to show their reconciliation after his imprisonment. And you can see throughout the quilt, um, she has squares that have the American flag. She definitely was a, a Northern um, woman, but she she was trying through her quilt to say that there is reconciliation that can happen. We can be one country again. And so um, I just thought this quilt has survived. It was actually sold at auction for one of the highest prices that a quilt ever received. It was sold for $264,000 at Sotheby's in 1991. It's now at the International Quilt Museum at the University of Nebraska, um, and you can see it there. And they do have quite a collection, I think, I, from what I've read of, of Civil War quilts at that International Quilt Museum. And then the last slide is just briefly to, to talk about what's going on with Civil War quilts today, um, post-Civil War. There's quite, there is an interest in Civil War quilts and Civil War fabric. It's not the type of fabric that you would see normally made in the quilt stores, but here in Tucson, there is a quilt store called the Cactus Quilt, and it was just recently sold and is moving to a new location on Rudicell and Oracle, but they have material that are reproductions of Civil War quilts and or material, and it's also pioneer material. And that's where a lot of people who are interested in the Civil War type era or making things from the Civil War would go to purchase. You can also purchase many of the quilts um, squares online. And what I thought was interesting, one of the, the quilt historian that was referenced in um, my, the, my introduction um, that got me interested in the Civil War quilts, her name is Barbara Brackman. And she has been a quilt historian for many, many years. And at the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War, she had this idea that she would do a blog online. And for 50 weeks out of that year, she would produce and publish in her blog a square. And the square would be representative of something that was happening in the Civil War with a focus on women and what was happening with women. She had no idea how many people would read this blog, but she um, got it started and was shocked to find that thousands of people were reading this blog. 
many of whom were making, because she gave the directions, many of whom were making the, the quilt squares. And not just in this country, but in countries around the world. And so she did publish eventually a book about each of those squares. And the quilt, the picture that you see is some of the squares that she developed. And I know it's maybe difficult to see, but down in the bottom row, the second block in um, the turquoise lines with the red line across, that's an H. And that was representative of the hospitals and the women who worked in the hospitals. There's a, a spool that's in, like empty thread spool to show that um, it was very difficult to get the, the thread that were was needed um, at the time. And so each one of the blocks tells a story. And originally when I thought this presentation was gonna be in person, I had this grand idea that I'd make some of these and bring them in and everybody could see them and we could talk about the stories. It'd be a little difficult to do that on Zoom. So I, I changed the focus and thought of how I would do the presentation, but maybe in a future one, um, if I get brave enough to do this again. But the people that made some of these squares of her quilts um, for this 150th anniversary got together and they made the quilt that you see on this picture for her. So she would have something to remind her of this time. And that's pretty much the end. I do have a, a resource of many of the books and the resources that I used in order to do the presentation. And as you can see, the first five are by Barbara Brackman. She's a very prolific writer and historian. And um, she really focused not just on the Civil War, but had such an interest in women and what was going on. So I'm going to stop my share here. And I don't know if there's any questions, but hopefully we'll have time if we have any. <laughs>